so welcome everybody. Uh, we've got the queen of, of Tim matching here, Natasha Simons, who very generously yet again has agreed um, to give us the, the, uh, the benefit of her wisdom and experience. Um, Natasha is wearing an extra crown uh, because of the recently awarded Stanford Prize. And I'll hand over now to Natasha to tell us a bit about that and so she can bask in her glory. <laughs> over to you, Natasha. Okay, so um, I'm the uh, project manager for the Griffith Research Hub and um, it's nice that Simon's let us have a little bask in the glory of the Commendation of Merit um, in the Stanford Prize for Innovation in Research Libraries and the whole place is kind of abuzz with that news at the moment and we're really hoping that the people who have the money also hear that news because we our project finishes on the 30th of June and we'd really like to keep extending the hub and we've got a list as long as your arm of stuff that we could do to it um, but we actually need some internal funding to do that so we're having a celebration here and inviting all the people who have some money to come along and hopefully they will give us some more funding to do that. But um, we were really amazed that they gave us that prize and there's some really awesome comments from the judges about that. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about Tim. Um, as uh, Simon asked me to do a Tim matching workshop. Um, so I worked at the National Library um, for about eight years and I worked on the party infrastructure project um, and I left just before um, that project finished. Um, so I'm going to talk today though, um, not, from, not as a National Library person because I haven't been there for nearly two years now, but um, just talking about Griffith's experience of the party infrastructure and also a hands-on like how to match using the, the TIM, which is the uh, Trove Identities Manager. Um, so there are lots of different paths into the party infrastructure and getting NLA party IDs and in this one I'm actually just going to talk about our experience here. So um, and it's sort of following on from a couple of discussions that we've had about um, the party infrastructure at this clinic which is Hoyland gave an excellent presentation a few weeks back and Simon's done a question and answer about it. Um, so the type of things I'm going to cover are setting up um, harvesting of party records by the NLA, um, the signing up and access to the Trove Identities Manager, the hand matching records using TIM and that's sort of, I'm going to use the um, test service to do that just as we speak, um, and also getting the NLA identifiers back um, and putting them in your metadata store and providing them to RDA. Um, and also just end with a summary of our experience. So I'm going to mention the successes, some of the issues as well. Um, so first of all, why bother? What's the point? Um, so it's just taking a moment to wonder why we're actually doing this. Um, so researchers have a lot of name variants. They publish under a lot of different names. Could be their first name, their initial, could, they could change their name. They might, um, they might be even a spell spelling error in the name that they publish under. And they also have a number of identifiers that are signed, assigned by different publishers and also assigned by the university and so on. And those sort of variations and multiple identifiers actually make it difficult um, for other researchers to find all works by a single researcher. And it also makes it difficult to find a specific work by a specific researcher if you're searching um, through a repository that holds those items. So historically the focus of research has been on publications and not on data. And it's also not been on the people who author the research. But um, information about a person provides a lot of contextual information that's really valuable for people, particularly on the web, to be able to find out more about the person who published the article and of getting a whole list of other articles that they've published that that person might be interested in using. Um, the other reason we're doing it is persistence. So um, web pages as URLs come and go and we need persistent identifiers for records about people and organisations so that they're managed in the long term. And the National Library Service is an identity resolution service which means that you can have multiple identifiers which all have the one NLA party identifier and that groups all of those identifiers and um, records contributed from different organisations under the one NLA party ID. 
Um, and the National Library is government funded and so and they have a commitment to maintaining these identifiers over time and that's the point about persistence. Um, so just briefly, this is a bit of an eye-watering diagram, um, so um, I'll try and talk you through it. It comes from the ARDC, actually the acronym for the Party Infrastructure Project was the a ARDC PIP, um, uh, uh, Australian Research Data Commons Party Infrastructure Project, and there's a document which describes the, the, the whole process and how you can contribute records and so on available on that project wiki, and this is a screenshot from that. But basically the project built on existing National Library infrastructure. So the National Library already had a service called People Australia and that was about identifying prominent Australians and um, their biographical information, their occupations, um, their just a whole lot of contextual information about them, um, their different name variants, their different publications and so on. And making that available in the end, the front end for that service became the Trove People and Organisation Zone. So Trove is the National Library Search Service and it has a number of different zones, which are things like digitised newspapers, pictures, and there is a zone for people and organisations and that is for exposing that type of information about prominent Australians and so forth. So the National Library already had that and the party inf and the, it, it sourced contributions to that service from the Australian Name Authority file in the first instance and that is a library name authority file that's contributed to by libraries across Australia. So that became the basis for the party infrastructure and most of those names are, are by people who have written books. So journal articles and so on have been a little outside that realm because they've been in the hands of commercial publishers rather than the books which um, you know clearly print people's names, birth dates, so forth. Um, and the, so the name authority file has been based on people who write books. So a lot of the stuff that we are contributing through the party infrastructure as institutions are by researchers who write journal articles. Um, so a lot of the records that we give will be new records that don't actually exist in the current infrastructure. Anyway, so that uh, the, libraries, uh, the National Library Service also has a number of other con uh, contributors, so Australian Dictionary of Biography Online, uh, VIAF, which is the Virtual International Authority File, and so on. So there's actually a massive number of records already in the NLA infrastructure. Um, and basically, I'm going to talk through how, how we have contributed to it. Um, so basically you have to set your records up for harvesting by the National Library. So the National Library has a custom built harvester that they built in house and it's used to harvest your metadata records. And you can provide your party records in either RIFCS format or EAC CPF format. So EAC CPF is the native format of the party infrastructure of um, the Trove People and Organisations zone and it's, um, it was put together by a range of organisations from the American Society of, Architect of Archivists to the State Library of Berlin and we had uh, Basil Dewhurst who was the project manager for the party infrastructure project was actually on the, on the board for developing that format um, and it's a specific metadata format for describing people and organisations but I'm not going to go through it in detail here. At Griffith we provide our records in RIFCS format um, you don't need to produce a special feed of party records. You can just give the NLA the regular RIFCS feed and their harvester will ignore the non-party records. So we just give them everything that we give to Research Data Australia and that just pulls out the party records. So you have to provide your base URL for harvesting to the NLA. So once you've got your RIFCS records ready and you've made them available for harvesting, um, and that little screenshot there is a list of our records with using our, uh, um, that we've made available for harvesting there. Um, so you can actually see them in a web browser. Um, the NLA then requests those records. Um, you, you also need to advise the NLA of your ISIL, which is your, I can't remember the acronym, International Standard Identifier for Libraries, something like that, which is basically AU for Australia, 
and your National Union catalogue symbol, um, which you can find on the ILRS um, guide. We'll actually show you online how to actually get your NUC symbol. Um, but all your library people should know what your what your NUC symbol use, is because it's used widely in libraries. So for Griffith, it's AU for Australia dash QGU, which is Queensland Griffith University. So it always starts the NUC always starts with your state the first initial of your state and then goes into your university code. Um, okay, so then once you've got your records set up, you ask the NLA to harvest your records. Um, if you like, you can ask the NLA to um, put in your personal email address into their harvester and that means that you will receive automatic notification from the harvester uh, of the status of your harvest and that's a really useful thing to see that the harvest went ahead, how many records were harvested, how many were errors, that sort of thing. Now in this harvest we are expecting those record errors because the record errors are for the non-party records. So they've failed because they're not party records. Um, so first the NLA harvests into their test environment, um, so that's completely safe. Um, they, it does not connect to production at all. Um, the first test harvest checks your records but doesn't actually get them, so it basically just checks the quality of your harvest. Um, then they run, if, you, if that goes ahead successfully, um, then you go ahead with a production harvest which basically gets all the records into the National Library's test system. So as they come in, Oh yeah, you can see that little diagram. The, it's a bit hidden for me, but um, the harvested records hit what's called the National Library of Australia's identity service, and that's where the matching rules are applied. And they're applied to see if your incoming records match the records that are in the Trove test system. So we're just talking about the test system at the moment. And records that fail automatic matching appear in the Trove Identities Manager for hand matching. Um, so the matching rules are fairly conservative, um, but they basically have to match exactly um, with an existing record to be co-located with it. Um, it also says uh, if there's definitely not a record in there with that surname and that first name or the initial of that first name, then a new record is automatically created. Um, and so the ones that fail then go into hand matching. So they're possible matches, matches that couldn't be worked out automatically. And if you read any of the literature around this, even from the, the name gurus overseas, um, particularly in Europe, that you can't actually get a matching algorithm that's better than about 95 to 97% accurate. And to improve that matching, we probably would need a lot of contextual information in the records, richer records, um, to build up, um, is this Jane Smith the same as this Jane Smith? Is Jane Smith who wrote a cookbook in 1980 the same Jane Smith who published on biology in 1982? Um, so you need a lot more information to actually determine that match. Um, so that's just an overview of the components and how it works. You then check your auto-matched records in the Trove test system and check your um, remaining records in TimBeta. I'll put the URLs up there. And if you're happy, um, the National Library can repeat that harvesting in their production environment. Um, and so there's a little tip there that you can view your records in Trove by entering your, your ISIL or your NUT code in the people and organisation zone. So this is the snapshot of Trove and I've just typed in QGU and it's brought up all of Griffith's records, um, although we've increased it since then. Um, okay, so to sign up for the Trove Identities Manager, um, you need to actually sign up to Trove and then you need to send a request through the Trove um, contact us page um, which has to say request from Anne's contributor for access to Tim. You give them your, um, your uh, university name, your ISIL code and your username and then they will set you up for access to Tim. So I was actually just going to demonstrate Tim now. Just let me get to it. Right, okay, so this is the Trove Identities Manager. Um, this is the Tim Beta service. Uh, I'm just going to get set up for this. 
So you just log in. So this is once you've got your login. Okay, so this now I'm in the Trove Identities Manager. So you only have access to action the records of your institution. You can't you can't action records from other institutions for very obvious reasons. Um, so this is a very simple drag and drop functionality that's quite easy to use. Um, and it was developed by an external um, company to the National Library and they we did quite a lot of usability testing on this and I think it is actually, that you'll find it's actually quite good. Um, but it's basically a left hand screen for your unmatched records and a right hand screen for records that already exist in the infrastructure. I'm just, just going to have to put that down. Yep. Okay. So, um, and we'll just ignore this tab at the moment, which is another this is actually used for disambiguation, that is for correcting mistakes. If you've accidentally matched the wrong person to a record, you can actually split them apart using this uh, tab, but I'll just leave that for the moment because I'm not going to show that today. Um, so I can only see Griffith's records. So if I click on Griffith University, it opens all of our records. Now, most of the ones that failed matching for us were our corporate records, so our party group records, and that's kind of, it's actually almost impossible to match party group records. Um, pretty much no one sticks to, uh, no one outside libraries and possibly even within them sticks to a proper way of describing organisations and that makes it very hard to match them. Um, so I'll just have a look at the first one, which is for our Ascitis Institute. Um, if I open the details tab, I can see the history, which is a little biographical statement about Ascitis. And this link here is back to our hub record for Ascitis because that record is coming from our research hub. And here we have a link back to the record in the Research Data Australia service. So if I want to search for possible matches, I click on the Ascitis um, name, on the name here, and it over on the right hand side has executed a search for that full name string, as well as any records with that identifier. So nothing has actually come up, but it doesn't convince me that there's nothing possibly in the infrastructure. So I can use the general search box to type in just the word Ascitis. And here it's a it's kind of a keywordy search. So it's searched all name fields and records for Ascitis. So this person, Catherine, is somehow connected to the Ascitis Institute. So that's you can see it down there. So that's why she's come up in the search results. But that's not the record I'm after, and no other Ascitis records have come up. So I'm pretty confident that there's no Ascite record for Ascitis in the party infrastructure. So I'm gonna create a new record with this. So I just click on it and drag it up to the top where it says drag here to create new identity. And the tab turns orange and I let go. And it says, are you sure you want to do this? So you've got time to change your mind or if you've accidentally dragged over the wrong thing. I do want to, so I click create new identity and it's instant, instantly created record with a NLA party ID here. So one issue with these, so instantly assigned and instantly available in Trove. So if I go into the Trove test service, which the URL is up there, and I open the people and organisation zone, type in Ascitis, and there it is. So it comes up, it's an instant thing once you've actually created a record. So you can see that um, it's actually really quick to do um, and very simple and the time consuming process is in working out if there's any possible matches and so forth. Um, so one issue with the Trove Identities Manager is that Hoyland pointed out too is that this NLA party ID in the test system they're not real party IDs, they're, they're just sort of fake ones so they can lead to the wrong um, a party record for you, it might be a bit confusing. So the way to get around that is to get into the Trove test service like, like I did just then and, and just do an actual manual search by name and then it will come up um, rather than click on this which will open. In this case it should open um, just a production record with that NLA party ID. So if I didn't know that, that would have been a bit confusing to me. So I know that's obviously something that needs to be fixed, but something to be aware of. 
Um, so let's have a look at a person record. So that was a group record. So I'm going to have a look at Ross Fitzgerald. So um, some of you might have heard of Ross. He's um, quite a famous um, academic, uh, retired now, um, but he's linked to Griffith University. So I've put a little bio for him in there um, and a link to his web page. Um, so to search for him, I just click on that name field. And again, it's searching for either his name or that identifier. But the problem with this is that it's actually searching for Ross and Fitzgerald and Emeritus and Professor. So actually, I'm not convinced that he's not in the system. So if I put in to the search box, that it, I, so I can't spell Fitzgerald. Um, Fitzgerald, search identities. It's just taking its time. You can see there's a little wormy there that turns while it's thinking about it. Um, so there's 297 results and I don't want to go through 297 results. So I'm going to use advanced search by clicking on that and then you can actually narrow down the search to the name field and that will be name and name variants. So if I put in Fitzgerald, well I've, I've already done it before. Here's one I prepared earlier. Search identities and that record has come up. So if I'm not sure, all I've got here is Ross Fitzgerald 1944. Over here I don't have a birth date because Griffith can't provide birth dates. It's against our privacy policy. Um, so I could actually open this record. Um, I'm going to click on that one. Now this by chance has actually opened the right um, identifier but you'll see up the top that it's actually in the production service. And I, um, just to confuse you, I actually, we actually matched um, these yesterday in production. So I know that um, that will actually show the Griffith record there, even though I haven't matched it in the test system yet. Um, so I can see from here though, that under resources for Ross Fitzgerald, he's got, my name is Ross and Alcoholics Journey, blah, 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 a number of his um, publications on politics. Back to the Trove service, if I open his record in the Research Hub, um, he doesn't have a long record because he's retired now um, and it's not a public, it's, you have to get there through the Hub link, not, you can't actually search the Hub for Ross Fitzgerald. Um, policy issue, another issue I'm not going to talk about at the moment. Um, but I can see here, uh, I could actually go through his books and see whether he was the same person or not, judging on what he'd written. Um, so I happen to know that he's the same He's the same professor. So I'm going to match this record, our unmatched record, with the one in the Trove service. So I click on this and move it across and this record then goes that sort of yellowy colour. So I let go. It's just click and drag. That's all I'm doing. I asked you if you want to add a note. Um, so probably the only reason you'd add a note is if you were splitting records rather than adding them. So I'm sure I just click move record. And there you go, the Griffith record has gone straight over there on the right hand side and it's basically co-located under that one NLA party ID. So you've got Libraries Australia contributing, Griffith University contributing and on the record itself um, in Trove you'll see Griffith University, Libraries Australia and you'll see the different contributions. Um, so that's basically how the matching works. Uh, I could do one more though. Oh, and I have to say that we are going to do some improvements to our corporate records following having looked at this because this sort of corporate heading is not very useful. Um, it comes from an internal Griffith system and it needs to be better than that before we give it to the NLA, I think. Um, so you can also search your own records here. Um, it will search your um, unmatched records. So this is one for Professor Palo Singh and if I click on that it opens, this particular one got a hit because the name is exact um, and when I open it there's a Libraries Australia and there's already a Griffith record there. Now um, before I was at Griffith and when I, when I was at the NLA actually, this has come back to bite me, um, this key here is griffith.eud 
.au instead of .edu.au. So someone made a mistake in the identifiers at Griffith. Um, and so that's why this record hasn't overlaid that record. If those identifiers had been exact, then the new harvest would have just overwritten this record with that record, over, overwritten this record over that one. So it hasn't, So and I want this one to replace it. So I'm going to move it over here. And then I'm actually going to hide this one from public view. I can't delete it, but I can hide it. So if I click hide, then that means that, oops, that means that in the public view of Trove, um, you will actually only see this record and this record, and not this record, which has got the wrong key in it. Um, so I think that was all I was going to show of basic overview of how to use the Trove Identity Service. Um, just go back into my thing. So you can actually get your records back from the NLA. Um, so you can get them back through OAI harvesting, so you can harvest your records back as a set um, and they'll come in a set with your ISIL, so for us it'll be AUQGU. Um, you can get them back through the SIU search and retrieval interface or you can get them back manually by looking into Trove and getting them that way, although that would be a very time consuming way of getting them back. Um, and then you can store them in your metadata stores and in your metadata store and provide them in the feed to Research Data Australia. So just some um, some of my the summary of things that I think would be good. Um, the problems, as I, I mentioned about the NLA identifiers resolving in the test system to the production pages, which is quite confusing. Also, um, the NLA would like RIF CS name parts to be in a certain order um, and I don't think we should have to do that um, if they're called given name and um, surname, I've forgotten the RIF code for it, um, then really the NLA should be able to deal with that and we shouldn't have to order them in a particular way so that they appear in Trove in a particular way. Um, so other tips are ask your librarians to do the hand matching because they're familiar with authority control for names and researchers and they've got the skill set already. Um, you should also, I would get more than one person to use TIM to spread the knowledge and the skills. So yesterday um, myself and Sam Searle and Stacey Lee sat down and did the matching for our records and it took about an hour and a half to get through, I think it was 30 odd, 33 odd records um, and that was including teaching them how to use TIM. So it's not actually really time consuming, it wasn't a time consuming thing for us and um, a lot of the issues that we had were actually to do with our own records um, and the quality of some of our own records, embarrassingly. Um, so you can also, as I said, set up automatic notification from the NLA Harvester so that you get um, your personal emails. Um, don't change your identifiers unless you really, really have to because you can see what happened to the Griffith ones um, that you have to go through and hide the old ones and change them and you muck up matching that way. Um, and nice to have, it would be really good to be able to get into the NLA Harvester and execute our own harvests, but you can't do that at the moment. You have to ask them to do it. But they can also set it up to harvest at particular interview intervals, whether that's weekly, monthly, daily, whatever you want. Um, so, and also to get automatic notifications oh, um, from Tim on statistics. So how many you've got left to match and so forth. But you don't have a time frame to match these in. With the unmatched records, they will just sit there ready for your hand matching until you get in there and do it. Um, so I'm actually going to leave it there. Um, okay. Now, uh, one of the, I know that there, there are often questions arising. Um, I've got a, a, a set of instructions where uh, there's lots of training modules on the ANS website and, and links to those from the Metadata Stores blog where there are detailed instructions on obtaining ISIL codes if you haven't done that already. The other thing is that we have a running list of uh, unexpected behaviours, some of which Natasha has mentioned in her problems uh, list. That, that list um, I know uh, is read by the NLA and it is a working list so the NLA are aware of these issues um, 
so they're not just going nowhere. Uh, they will, it, they may form a case for them to get more resources to try and address some of them. But the 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 thing is that you, we, we don't want you to overwhelm Natasha with questions um, outside of here. Probably your best your first port of call will be us at Anne's, and beside me is Julie. Just there she is, Julie McCulloch. And Julie has done a written training modules and has been taking detailed notes here. So if you have questions, please contact us. Um, now, Natasha is the reigning queen of matching, but, but we don't want to bother her unless we've run out of ideas. Uh, is that okay with you, Natasha? Yep. Oh, look, if, um, I, yeah, because my paid job is managing the research arm, so I kind of have to do that one first. But um, if you maybe, I was just thinking, yeah, if there's a discussion thread that people want to use, I could um, answer some questions on there because I, I know it's a bit frustrating if you can't get answers very quickly to the things you need to get and I do have some insider knowledge but I can't always answer them because sometimes they require you know someone looking into a technical problem or it might be that something's actually changed in the NLA system and I might give the wrong answer so yeah it's probably good if they're if they're on a list and then people can share the questions you know and I know it's a bit hard because you sometimes feel a bit embarrassed asking stuff things, but I think this is one of those areas where there are lots of questions and there's really <laughs> a lot of first time questions about it because it's quite a complex thing to get. Well with that Natasha I'd just like to thank you again for your generosity uh, of, of time and spirit uh, and, and the benefit of your wisdom. Thank you for, for that. Um, it, it was a full house. Every, there's a lot of interest and We'll try not to bother you with follow-up questions, um, <laughs> although I know that you're, you you just you keep solving people's problems. So yeah, thank I, you I very much. <laughs> yep, you go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, thanks for the and I hope it was useful for people.